It's called Sun. The sun is my flag. All others are temporary. Only that flag in the sky was here when the dinosaurs were out there cabbage patching, having all the best of it while lording over everything and everybody, not needing to pay attention to their P's and Q's. What distant cousins of men wore around at the time stayed in the water, well out of the dinosaurs' way. Over the earth reigned the flag of the sun, and the reptiles carried their flags in their jaws. If they, if they could have spoken English, they would have called their flags teeth. They were more honest than men. The dinosaurs fought among themselves for a few tens of thousands of years until the sun was taken from them for a short while by what intellectuals now say was some great cosmic accident and upheaval of nature that had nothing to do with God. The mighty dinosaurs could do nothing without the sun but die. Even their teeth rotted eventually. Now men rule over the earth. They fight and argue about which man is mightier and which flag will rule. In a place temporarily called Alabama, State Representative Thomas Reed, a black man, went to try and take down the Confederate flag from atop the state capitol in Montgomery in February of 1988. The governor of Alabama, Guy Hunt, a white man, had Representative Reed and 11 other men who wanted to take down the flag arrested by white police, who can be to black men what Tyrannosaurus Rex was to dinosaurs. This Confederate flag was around 130 years old when Representative Reed tried to take it down. It stood for oppression to him. To Governor Hunt, it was a symbol of power lording over everything and everybody, so the two men fought. It does not matter what they f that they fought in a civilized manner, not to the sun. The sun does nothing but shine on. It is all happening in 150 years, the space of less than a second by the sun's time. Men have determined the length of the sun's life expectancy, and they probably aren't off by more than two or three million years. We'll never know. Why is the sun my flag? Simple. First, a story. My first experience with the Confederate flag came when I was quite a boy, much more interested in dinosaurs and girls than the missteps of men. I went to the circus one day with my class. The circus is one of the last remaining approximations of the Mesozoic age around these days, outside the veld. I think I was eight or nine years old. The circus was wonderful to me then. I remember that, although I cannot remember any of these acts. I only remember the whole experience warmly. My friends and schoolmates and I sat together, little black children, as I would later find out. At the time, we were just children. My wonderful mother had given me three dollars with which to find food and perhaps a small souvenir at the circus. Gaunt vendors snaked through our small party, hawking their cheap wares. Among their trinkets were small flags of two types, the American flag, by this time fifty stars worth, and the Confederate flag. For some reason, the hawkers pressed the Confederate flags on us, and I, always a fool, bought one for 50 cents. I suppose this makes my group seem naive, even though we were eight or nine years old. Even then, we should have had some idea of history, but our instructors, I suppose, had more important things to teach us up until that point. We were in third grade. I only know that I walked home in a dark blue car coat, with my Confederate flag fluttering mightily in the autumn breeze. When I arrived home, I went directly to the back room, which was the bedroom for three boys. I tacked my flag on the wall above and behind the tiny gas heater. I stood back and admired my handiwork. Then my mother entered the room. She had resided off and on in the South for a much greater time than I had. She took the Confederate flag off the wall and lit a match. I thought she was going to light the small gas floor furnace. Instead, she immolated the flag. I was inconsolable. I considered the flag mine, merely because I had bought it and possessed it for a while. I didn't consider that my harried but calm, brilliant and productive mother had given me the money with which I bought the flag. I could not have gotten the flag on my own. I was but a boy, and had no understanding or appreciation of these facts. My mother explained that I would understand one day, and then led me out of the back room to some other activity, possibly piano practice. This only led me into an even worse mood. I escaped it when the piano lesson was over and never thought about flags again for a long time. So that now the sun is my flag. I know nobody is ever going to try and capture it. It is too strong. I know it does not belong to me, but to all under it. Its value and meaning are inherently benevolent. There is nothing bad about it. The sun is my flag, not my god, as it was with some Egyptians in Amon-Ra. Such beliefs are silly. 
In fact, after a certain age, one cannot believe in gods not and be considered an intellectual. Some people would rather be considered intellectual than human. When you realize how puny humans are, you can see the intellectual's point in this matter. As intellectuals, they believe they can figure things out, things like there is no god, there is only nature and science. When intellectuals finally get around to believing in God, which usually happens after they get older, they have to intellectualize their belief, as one German philosopher did. The only reason people still remember Nietzsche is because he was an intellectual. He is supposed to have intellectualized that as well. As he got older, he saw the rationale of believing, intellectually, of course, because it was safer. If he believed, and there turned out to be a God like the Egyptians thought, then he would be on God's good side. It would be safer to believe, for there wasn't that much of a difference to him between believing and not believing. So he believed with the scientific detachment of an intellectual. I'm more in the camp of Amenhotep I, the Kemet Egyptian pharaoh, who came to the conclusion that there is one god. He called him Aten. Amenhotep had a healthy respect for the sun, too. Like me, he probably also believed what he could see. Unlike me, he didn't have to worry about television. The sun is the flag of God not God itself, but a manifestation of God. The sun lets me know that there is a God, although I can't see what God calls itself. I'm not a pharaoh. I merely feel the presence is there. I know it not because of sermons I've sat through. I know it more because of the sun. I cannot believe something as mighty as the sun just happened out of a complete and total vacuum. If it had, then that's one element of the phenomenon, a mighty orb so immense that it lights entire worlds which were once part of it, but now circle it obediently, millions of miles away. And the sun warms these worlds. This world has been warmed just right, so that dinosaurs and men could safely grow on it, grow up to fight and hoist flags and pistols and estimate the sun's life expectancy in their spare time. Now, all that is one link in an accidental chain of events. Now realize that there are billions of suns, all over what men call the universe. And yet there is no God. I'm sorry, it, it, it makes sense to believe. It's, it's not like the sun is just there. Every day it turns over the world and provides it with light. The sun gives people a reason to go on because it will come up tomorrow. It is the reason for life. Even if you don't believe there is a God, you know there is a sun, and you know that without it, even for mere minutes, all men would die. And after all the men are dead and their flags long decayed, if the sun decided or was ordered to return, something would come up from the water and take the place of man and go about the same business. Everything under the sun makes too much sense for it all to have been accidental. Everything rotates, comes full circle. There are too many cycles for it not to be so. The sun dictates what we can eat, where we can eat it, where we can go, and when we can go there. It shapes how we feel and what we care about. One of the great yet simple facts of the sun has sent men into intellectual tizzies for eons. It is the simple fact that the sun causes skin color. Not intellectuals, not sperm banks, not what Massa say. Nothing else has anything to do with pigmentation. It is a manifestation of the power of the sun. The sun made the races of men. The closer you were to the equator, the more you were blessed by the sun. Only men could twist this to mean that men were to be judged by racism and pigmentation. Probably the most intellectual white man around these days is Stephen Jay Gould, an anthrop anthropologist and paleontologist. Those titles are there to impress the intellectuals. Actually, Mr. Gould's most impressive title is that of teacher. He seems to have thought most things through. And since he is a teacher, he should be and is magnanimous with his learnings. All in all, an admirable, memorable man. Gould refutes quite clearly some men's desire to say that men, man first came into being in Asia, not Africa. Africa means black men, and black men are inferior. All these things have been inferred. Stephen J. Gould puts the kibosh in all that with great intellectual style, writing page after page of common sense dressed in intellectual clothing. And even Mr. Gould admits that the saturation bombing of racial prejudice by color, a mere simple act of the sun, is pierced even his own high intellect. Mr. Gould, in the May 1986 issue of Discover magazine, quote, The racist traditions of our cultures run so deep that vestiges remain, in distant and unrecognized form, even among those who've struggled hard to overcome all prejudice. I, I may perhaps underscore this point by telling a story against myself. 
My friend, fellow paleontologist Bjorn Curtin, wrote a fine novel, Dance of the Tiger, about the contact of Neanderthal and Cro-Mangon people in Europe some 35,000 years ago. He depicted the primitive indigenous Neanderthal as white and the advanced invading Cro-Mangon as dark. This jolted me because, quite subconsciously, I had always pictured Neanderthals as dark and Cro-Mangon as light. Yet I realized that Curtin's conjecture is much the more reasonable since cold, adap pe cold adapted people tend to be light and Neanderthals were a European race of Homo sapiens, while Cro-Magnon people may have invaded from warmer climates. I then had asked myself why I had unthinkingly shunned the more reasonable hypothesis. The answer can only be vestigial racism. I had, much to my embarrassment, equated primitive with dark and advanced with white." End quote. Mr. Gould had nothing to be embarrassed about because even intellectuals are controlled by television programs. There has never been a more apt name for what we are all forced to see on television. We are programmed, programmed to think the way we do. Television is a flag, too, but it is not as benevolent as the sun. Television can be like the Confederate flag. It can stand for power and corruption. If you watch enough television, and most people do, you would find that the sun seems to make people act in strange ways. All the white people seem normal, but the black people seem like cardboard. All the white people are beautiful. All the black people are just around. All the white people know everything. Most of the black people have to be told. The white people are portrayed in a positive light. Most of the black people are not. Intellectuals might write this off as a great cosmic accidental upheaval of nature having nothing to do with God, but... I think differently. And so men fight and argue over what the sun has wrought, so many, the many colors of their skins. The programming has been so effective that even among one race of people, black people, this fighting occurs. Black people have been to the four corners of the earth in a variety of situations, only one or two of which have been depicted on television. On television, you'd think the only time Africans ever got out was on slave ships. And that every shade of brown is the result of some long past rape. Well, many shades are, but the sun had everything to do with it. In fact, it merely offers its blessing. Humans complicate it uh, by thinking the sun was too generous with some of them, and they think that way because of flags like the Confederate flag in television. Complexion has become too intellectual a word for me. I prefer the word used by, old, by the old folk around where I grew up. Complected. They were light-complected people, brown-skinned people, and dark-complected people. The word complected makes me think of complications and afflictions, so it is a much better word for me in this context. Complexion can confuse. Some light-complexioned people want nothing to do with dark-complexioned people. Yet you couldn't bring some light-complexioned people anything but a dark-complexioned mate, and vice versa for some dark-complexioned people. All this confusion is a result of programming, too much television, too many flags, not enough sun. Yet too much sun can kill. Talk of your flag's power by comparison. Intellectuals, once you take the bait and invite them to speak, will talk about the possibility of another great cosmic accidental upheaval of nature that has nothing to do with God. They call this one nuclear winter. We could check it out with the dinosaurs, only no dinosaurs are left. The sun will come up tomorrow. Whether or not any of us are here to see it is another matter. Long after the Confederate flag has been forgotten, the sun will be there, shining and lording over all of whoever and whatever remains. Every new day will start with the sun. I feel blessed merely to have been one of its more fortunate subjects.